very honored to introduce our chief guest, Mr. Robert Hanna, who is the great-great-grandson of Mr. John Muir and the founder of Range of Light. So because of John Muir's activism and preservation efforts, we can now enjoy so many natural areas like Muir Woods, Sequoia National Park, Yosemite Valley, and many other wilderness areas. I'm very honored and excited that he's here today, and I can't wait, till he, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. So please help me welcome Mr. Robert Hanna. Thank you. How's everyone doing? I wanted to, uh, to start today first by, uh, by thanking Pavan and Green Kids organization. And uh, this organization is absolutely incredible. And the work that you're doing is, is so inspiring. Uh, and it's, it's changing the world. And it's cultivating a, an entirely new generation of leaders. And I just want to thank you. So I ask uh, if everybody could please give one round of applause for, uh, for Green Kids and Pavon. Thank you for your leadership. I've been very blessed in my life to come from a family that all throughout my life has just taught us to respect the outdoors, uh, to enjoy our parks, to protect them. And it's quite interesting how my presentation today really tells the story of what's happening in all of the rooms behind us. And as I walk through today, it was just absolutely amazing to see all of the passion, all of the love that every single person in there, whether they were at their booth or as an exhibitor, uh, they're following their dreams. They're, they're so passionate about what they do. And every single one of them should be absolutely, you know, proud of themselves because those are the next leaders of our of our generation and uh, we all have that responsibility to hand that off to the next one and this is a, a photo of my great great grandfather in Yosemite around 1870 and as you can see I found that exact same spot and this was taken in the same month as that was taken and uh, you can see quite a difference in water flow from that time I wanted to start by a quote that John Muir's daughter, Wanda, my great-grandmother, said to a friend in 1939, and it kind of goes into a little bit about the site of Muir that I will be talking about today. And in 1939, she wrote to a friend, many people know my father as a naturalist, but the world has never understood him as a man. If you'd had known him, you'd have seen only one side of him, and he had many sides. No two people, even his closest friends, ever had quite the same idea about him. And the story today starts uh, when John Muir was born on April 21st, 1838 in Dunbar, Scotland to his parents, Daniel and Anne. And John was one of eight children. And these are his siblings. His sisters were Annie, Sarah, Mary, Margaret, Joanna. And then the boys were David, John, and Daniel. This is the uh, picture of John Muir's birthplace in Dunbar, Scotland. And when John was uh, 11 years old, his father made a, a pretty, uh, pretty big announcement to the family. And his father announced in 1849 that they were going to move to America. And at that point, John was uh, 11 years old. So he and his brother leave with their father to Wisconsin. And his, uh, him and his brother are tasked with a strict farm life routine to work around the clock to satisfy their father's demands. And upon completion of their new Fountain Lake home, they immigrated to Wisconsin. Upon completion of that home, John's father then sent for the rest of the family to come and join them in their new home here in the United States. This house was a, a pretty significant place in John Muir's life. A lot of people have read about, and it's been very well documented about his achievements later on in his life with protecting and preserving parks and his love of, of the outdoors and protecting beautiful uh, open space. But a lot of people don't realize that John Muir as a young boy was just like every single one of you young kids in here today and all of those people who were exhibiting their incredible talents out there. He was absolutely fascinated by science and botany. And he, he continually you know, just educated himself to all of the incredible opportunities that were out in the world 
And even as a young boy, his father was very strict and would not let him read during the day because his father felt that during the day, time should be spent on the farm. But his father basically agreed to let him wake up as early as he wanted, as long as he was ready for the next day's work at 5 a.m. So many times John would wake up at midnight or one in the morning and he would just read books for four or five hours before his day would start. And right there in the cellar of that house, that's where his imagination really blossomed, just like I saw as I was walking through the mini exhibits and booths today. And in his early teens, he started creating these incredible inventions. This is an actual drawing of his self-setting table saw, which was powered by water. And as you can imagine, this is that, that thirst for knowledge and that, that wanting to you know, come out with better technology at the times. And that's the number one thing that I saw when I was going through today is each and every one of you are doing the exact same thing. So it was very interesting to just see how it went hand in hand. And this is another, this was a clock that he created while he was out on the farm, which was powered by wind. And you could see, you know, a young 13, 14 year old boy, you could see where his mind started to develop based on his imagination. And uh, it was very detailed. I mean, I mean, that's incredible. This is a barometer that he created when he was 15 years old. This is one of his water clocks powered solely on a stream right in the back of his, uh, his farm there in Wisconsin. And that's the original clock that was given back to the University of Wisconsin. And just as his father had made a surprise announcement when uh, John was a young boy, now at the age of 22, John made his own surprise uh, announcement to his family. And John announced that he is uh, leaving uh, the farm to exhibit his inventions at the State Agriculture Fair in Ma Madison, Wisconsin. And you could already kind of see he had a mind where he wanted to experience all of this incredible opportunity out. And so he leaves and he works many, many uh, different jobs to put himself through school. And something absolutely incredible happened at this exhibit that would no doubt you know, change John Muir's life and lead him onto the path that we all know today. At this fair, he was now able to showcase even more incredible inventions that he had. And one story in particular talks about one, one, one contraption, if you would, that had hundreds and hundreds of people surrounding it. And John had created what he called a wake-up bed. And the cl it's, it's written that the clock would raise up the bed and set the sleeper on his feet. To aid him in his demonstrations, Muir had secured the enthusiastic assistance of two small boys. The lads pretended to be asleep until the contraband set them up on their feet amid the cheers of the large crowd who had gathered at this incredible display. So you could see he, he, was, he was bettering the technology then. He was letting his imagination go wild and he had created a bed that was set to a timer that at certain points of the day would throw him up. You know, it's just absolutely amazing. And once at the University of Wisconsin, it didn't stop there. The, the, the inventions became even more elaborate. And now he had even more exposure and books and resources to use for these incredible inventions. And this one was his clock desk. And it was written that the mechanism controlled a collapsing bed which awoke Muir by sliding him to the floor while at the same time lighting a lamp. After a few minutes allotted for dressing, the desk began ejecting and retracting Muir's books following a preset schedule of time allowed for study of each subject. So where we just learned about the bed that threw him up on his feet, this device was tied to that bed, and after a few minutes allowing, allowing Muir to, to get dressed, it would pop his books up, and it was set so the pages would turn at certain times. And when the book was complete, it would drop down into a, a box. This is an actual picture of that device, and it's hard to see just how large it is, but this device is over six feet tall. And so you could see, you know, there were some pretty incredible things going on in this dorm room, and it soon, you know, just be he began to be the talk of, of the whole university. This is a close-up shot, again, just to show you how large this contraption was. That's a 400-page uh, book, and you could see that after the book was complete, that that middle piece would slide open and the book would fall in and then it would pop out the next one. And uh, 
Just one more, this was his loafer chair. This one's a little bit dangerous, so I don't uh, encourage uh, kids to rebuild this, but this was a famous one that's written that Muir's loafer chair was a wooden chair with a split bottom over which an awkward cross piece had been nailed in front, apparently to cure the split, but really to make the sitter spread his knees. As soon as the supposed loafer settled down on the chair and leaned back, he pressed a concealed spring which fired a heavily charged old pistol directly under the seat. The leaps of the victims are said to have been worth seeing, and for decades afterwards, the janitor told of the marvels of Muir's inventions. This is a, uh, a picture of Muir in uh, 1863, and this is a period in, in his life that that changed his life forever. You could already see that he had a mind and, a, and a, an incredible imagination which he was able to transfer into these incredible inventions. But soon, he runs out of money and can no longer put his way through, put himself through school. So he leaves the university in 1863, and in very Muir-like fashion, he walks all throughout Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Canada. And at this point in his life, he really starts to focus on botany and develops a special bond with the natural beauty around him. And at this point in his life, in his early 20s, just as we had seen that inventive mind come to, come to, to bloom, we see the business side of him come. And soon, in many of the different jobs that he's working in different factories, he starts creating these incredible charts and workflow uh, analysis that soon every single factory that he works at, productivity and efficiency is just going through the roof. And this is an actual one-day workflow chart that he creates. And it's very interesting, and I know it's hard to read, but at the very top, he talks about what time to feed people to get the most out of them. He talks about how long they should work, how long their breaks should be, when they should take breaks. And that middle piece is a, a diagram of the entire, all of the workstations. And he talks about how a workstation operates just like a clock. And at this factory that you just saw, an event that would change his life forever happened on March 9, 1867. And on that day, he writes to his mother, while connecting a machine belt, I accidentally thrust the point of a file into my right eye Tuesday. There is damage, I am completely prostrated, and the eye is lost. And this was a very interesting time in Muir's life because at this point, he didn't know exactly what he wanted to do. He, he knew he could have been a very successful businessman, and with all of his, his gadgets and inventions, you know, he wanted to make a lot of money. But with this accident, it left him completely blind. Uh, first, he lost sight immediately in the injured eye. And then because of the injury, he slowly began to lose all sight in the other eye as well. So for over a month, he sat in complete darkness and was absolutely devastated because, one, he didn't know if he was ever going to see again. But he felt that he had given up his passion of the outdoors by pursuing the pursuit of money. And so at this point in his life, in complete darkness for over a month, he makes a pact with himself that should he ever regain his sight again, he would give up the life of money and he would pursue his dreams of enjoying and protecting the outdoors. And that's exactly what happens. Slowly and slowly and slowly, he begins to get his eyesight back. And soon, his eyesight is completely back. And at that point, he made good on his promise. And right after that, he picks up a journal, and for the very first time, he sets out to establish and dedicate his life to the outdoor beauty. And he picks up this journal in 1867, and he signs it at the top left, John Muir, Earth, Planet, Universe. And that would be the path of John Muir taking to become the man that we all know today. And I think that, you know, the stories that have been passed down through my generation are much like this in the sense that it's so important to follow your dreams and to, to dedicate yourself to something that you love. And as a father myself to three young daughters, you know, I, I, I really take pride in, in the responsibility that I have as a parent, and I think that all parents share is that it is our responsibility, uh, responsibility to keep our children's imaginations lit forever. 
and to encourage them to follow their dreams. Because what's happening in these rooms behind us and all these exhibitors and, and these booths are, it's, it's changing the world. And it's so important to grow that. And had Muir not had been injured, who knows what the path would have, you know, what, what path he would have uh, gone down. But because of that injury, he dedicated himself to what made him, you know, happy. And that was the outdoors. And he carried that all through his life. Even in these later pictures, when he was in his 70s, you could see, you know, he studied every single animal that he came across, every single flower and specimen. You know, this is a, the photos of him at the Petrified Forest. And you could see he looks like a little schoolboy, you know, just so fascinated, still in his 70s. And that is the passion that he would carry with him all throughout his life. And that is the exact same passion and imagination that I got to see today, and I'm forever thankful for that. And uh, with that, I just wanted to again thank uh, Pavan and, and, and Green Kids, because by bringing us here today, you're giving all of this incredible talent and, and incredible passion a place to share what they're doing with the world. And I think that that's in, in just so important, you know, moving forward. And uh, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you and to uh, let you all know that it's a great honor to be a part of your day. Thank you very much.